What's up guys, my name is Jake and welcome to Abandoned, episode 61. If you've watched my videos for some time now, or if you have an overall interest in abandoned entertainment locations, then you're likely familiar with some of the most popular places like Disney's River Country or Six Flags New Orleans. Close for strong coming July 6th. But there's always been one major location seemingly always forgotten about. It was an expensive and recent escapade set out by a team of theme park veterans under the iconic Hard Rock Cafe name. What they ended up building was a massive theme park in the tourist-heavy destination of Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. However, behind the scenes, a complex and contentious financial battle was occurring. So devastating, in fact, that this Hard Rock theme park closed after being open for just under a year. This is insane, and the more I look into it, the more I just can't believe how much went wrong. So today, join me as I break down for you what happened here, and how a huge theme park was abandoned just a few miles away from the beaches of South Carolina. This episode of Abandoned is sponsored by Morning Brew, a simple and fun way to stay informed. Click the link in the description below to join now. It all began with a man named John Binkowski, an industry veteran who worked in film production, then pivoted to physical-themed entertainment. He also owned a theater with an ice skating show just a few miles away from the shores of Myrtle Beach. The events of September 11, 2001, however, had forced the entire tourism industry into a slump, and that Myrtle Beach theater became one of John's only remaining assets. However, he had grander plans for the area. After all, his theater was surrounded by vacant land, perfect for developing a tourist attraction, confident he could draw tourists away from the beaches. So, with the help of other investors and local landowners themselves, John spearheaded a new development named Fantasy Harbor, a master plan development where a theme park would become the centerpiece. It was themed after the four seasons of a year, with each land divided up into those four. The Summer Bay Land was planned to incorporate John's struggling theater. With a pretty detailed concept in hand, the team approached industry veteran Steve Goodwin to secure financing. But due to the park's lack of intellectual property, the generic rides had proven not to be enough of a draw for investment. So, after approaching many of the major entertainment companies, only MGM showed interest. A master plan was then drawn to incorporate the brand into their concept drawings. But, with little copyright ownership useful for a theme park, the scope of the brand was limited and essentially it was back to the drawing board. Rather abruptly though, John came up with an idea for a theme park to be based entirely around music, something that had never been done before. One of his colleagues tied in with the project had previously worked with Hard Rock International to build their hotels and famous cafes. According to Josh Young at Theme Park University, who has brilliantly documented the story, it turns out that the vice president of Hard Rock Franchise Operations was literally John's next-door neighbor in Celebration, Florida. The two soon met, and just a few months later, a licensing deal was secured with Hard Rock International to build the now-named Hard Rock Park in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. The park was now being designed specifically with Hard Rock in mind, shaping this into four distinct lands, all based around the lake in the middle. Surrounding it would be classic rock, cool country, world rhythms, and born in the USA. It was 2003 and major planning continued, as did the raising of the necessary funds not only to pay Hard Rock for their licensing fees, but to actually build the park. Ultimately, it was the neighboring properties that raised the $2.5 million necessary for Hard Rock's branding, and the general funding for construction and loan payments was secured by a private investment firm out of New York. Cunningham and Morris Architects, a longtime architectural collaborator with the Hard Rock brand, was brought in, and the theme park idea was expanding even further. Through the same year, Hard Rock was planning other theme park locations around the world, including one in Texas which would have also included a Hard Rock water park, and an enormous entertainment complex somewhere overseas in Tropical. The Texas one particularly was commissioned by Hard Rock themselves, however both of these projects never followed through, and it was down to just the park in Myrtle Beach to become the first branded theme park. By 2006, the total budget combined was now raised to $400 million, and with schematics and a finalized park layout, construction soon commenced in 2007. Now, $400 million seems like a lot of money, and it is, but really, that's still considered a small amount for a theme park. 
With that being said, Hard Rock Park, despite its branding, was going to be a completely private enterprise. One of very few ever attempted in America, especially in recent times. The most notable one for me, of course, is Jazzland in New Orleans. But John and his team for the project were hoping for a much better outcome in Myrtle Beach. Construction moved along quickly, eventually rolling into early 2008 when the facility was finally finished both under budget and a month early. The theme park soft opened through this time until finally, on June 2nd, 2008, the culmination of over half a decade of work had finally paid off when Hard Rock Park officially opened to the public. With a big opening and lots of people coming through the gates to see what America's newest major theme park was like, what the majority of guests realized was that this was a pretty great experience. Hard Rock Park had now evolved its attractions and lands into six distinct areas by opening day. These included All Access Entry Plaza, Lost in the 70s, Rock and Roll Heaven, British Invasion, Born in the USA, and Cool Country. After walking down the entrance plaza, a cleverly angled path would open up to reveal the existing lake and the park's icon at the other end, a neon lit 90 foot tall electric guitar. This certainly set the mood as when you walk around the lake and found yourself in these distinct lands, key attractions would catch your eye, like the towering Led Zeppelin The Ride, the slippery when wet water ride, and the Eagles Life in the Fast Lane. All thrilling attractions. The park also boasted many award-winning shows, including one inside John's former theater, now incorporated and rethemed into the cool country area. What the park perhaps lacked in rides, they made up for in theming and creativity. There was a good amount of wit and humor pumped into many of the aspects of the public areas that also had creative and quirky landmarks spread throughout. The theming had depth and care put into it, and it really did add to the overall fun atmosphere. The only thing seemingly missing was an actual Hard Rock Cafe. By the evening, guests would enjoy the Bohemian Rhapsody water and light show around the park's main lagoon, perfectly finishing off a day of fun, complete with some really cool visuals and a great incorporation of the park's landmarks. They made great use of their available land, too, making their small budget go a long way. Even the main dark ride, The Trip, created by Sally Dark Rides, was entirely housed within a portion of the existing abandoned mall on the land. That also meant there was potential for even further expansion with more uses for that mall, and other key areas of vacant land around the park, set aside for a prosperous future. However, that future was unknowingly about to be short-lived. As we've discussed all too much on this channel, 2008 was not a great year for new development. Hard Rock Park had a capacity for around 30,000 guests within the park. However, as a result of high gas prices, lower amount of spending for consumers, and a general decrease of tourism, the theme park began to see lower and lower attendance numbers. At opening, operating hours extended all the way to 1am each night, but now it only made sense to decrease those hours to 10pm. With critically low attendance, it was decided that after Labor Day 2008, Hard Rock Park would move to a weekend-only operating schedule. During some days, attendance was only 1,000 people a day, where it should have been around 10,000. With spending down as a whole for tourists, Hard Rock Park decided to set all admission prices to $50, including for children. They thought if they made one price across the board it would help, but it instead backfired. All of this was obviously a massive problem, and the park wasn't bringing in money. Certainly not enough for a much bigger issue they now had. The problem was the fact that the majority of investments into Hard Rock Park were loans. So when the economy began to take a nosedive in 2008, their interest rates on those multi-million dollar loans for construction had skyrocketed. That's a deadly combination when little money is coming in the door to keep up with their ballooning interest rates. Money was flying off their books and thrusted the park into severe debt with no cash reserve in place since it had literally just opened. The owners were put into an extremely difficult situation and ultimately saw no way out. Hard Rock Park closed its gates permanently on September 24th, 2008, just three months and 22 days since its grand opening. After the closure, the company declared Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. Initially, they had hopes of reopening, but soon announced they would instead liquidate the park by selling it off in bankruptcy court. 
By December, the property was put up for auction with the stipulation of a minimum price of $35 million, along with proof of competence in operating and running a business of this nature. Ultimately, the courts accepted a $25 million bid from a company named FPI MB Entertainment LLC. While they had the choice to keep the Hard Rock's name attached, they instead decided to entirely rebrand the facility, citing Hard Rock's name wasn't family-oriented enough and that it had a bad connotation with guests. So in April, sticking with the music theme of the park, they had unveiled their new name, Freestyle Music Park. Their plan was to ever so slightly change key elements about the park, including the names of each land, drifting it away from rock and roll and more to all genres of music. A key point they made was also the inclusion of a kids area. Overall though, the bones of Hard Rock Park remained in place. The new owners, however, were insistent on the prospect of a bright future for this property, and even stated that this would be the first of a worldwide expansion of the Freestyle Park brand. Yeah, okay. However, issues already began with the previous owners of Hard Rock Park filing a lawsuit to these new owners over what they claimed was copyright infringement. Since MB Entertainment was changing so little, and they were essentially just planning to operate the former park to their gain. But still, undeterred, they claimed they were in this for the long haul. So we're going to do everything we can to uh, uh, make the park viable this summer, and I mean, we're in this for the long haul. Freestyle Music Park ultimately opened on May 23rd, 2009, at just $40 for admission, with many promotions over the summer. After one full season, the park closed for the winter on September 14th, 2009 with a lower than expected attendance for the season. To add on top of this poor financial year, the company began receiving lawsuit filings to an almost comical amount. MB Entertainment had seemed to have pissed off a lot of people with their operations, receiving suits from contractors who claimed they weren't paid for their work, investors and creditors who loaned money, local governments, and even BMW for their use of trademarks in the park. Altogether, there were over 17 lawsuits filed, seeking millions of dollars in payment. Despite this, the owners assured everyone would be paid. Yet, by April of 2010, they claimed they didn't have any money left. This sent the property into a foreclosure, as their mortgage on the park was unpaid, with the interest gaining around $10,000 a day. By now, grass and weeds had been peeking through the ever-growing cracks in the parking lot. Weathering and rust was now showing up on the buildings dotted around the park, a seemingly obvious sign of neglect that was taking a foothold on the idle grounds. The 2010 season should have already started by now, and with MB Entertainment claiming they were aggressively seeking out new investors to get the gates open, it never came. With the management company who owned them collapsing in on themselves, the land defaulted to the formal mortgage owner run by a Russian businessman who had ties with MB Entertainment. The whole thing is confusing and of course sparked even more lawsuits, but the gist was that they didn't have any money to reopen. As a number of years passed and several campaigns to raise money by other organizations failed, Freestyle Music Park sat abandoned, waiting for someone to come in and save the property. Or get radical with their assets. By 2013, the owners of Freestyle decided they might as well extract as much value as possible from the property since the land wasn't selling. It was reported in November that a number of the rides had gone up for sale and were eventually sold soon after. One by one, rides began to be dismantled and shipped out across the world by summer of 2014, now leaving Freestyle with no future. By 2016, all rides of value had been removed and sold, along with whatever was valuable in the buildings, as all the theaters and ride stations were torn down and dismantled. Security was still on the premises and actively caring for the park, one that now only had small buildings standing and the bones of a once thriving and colorful theme park. As rumors of a Chinese company seeking to develop the site fizzled away, the park remained abandoned with no legitimate development on the horizon. On December 30th, 2018, however, the land was finally sold to a developer named Bishop Parkway LLC. Apparently, that company was in partnership with Myrtle Beach's former mayor, who claimed he wasn't sure what to do with the land and also claimed it would not be a theme park. But while these very slow land transfers took place, what was on the actual land was suffering. 
The Hard Rock turned freestyle music park continued to sit as it was from 2016 a shell of its former self. Only populated by its entrance plaza, the many shops and eateries, and the abandoned mall at the end of the property. As years passed, more and more people began finding their way in, and what was still standing very quickly began to show decay and vandalism. In just a few short years, the main street went from looking like this, to just recently this. The level of destruction and decay is honestly astounding. The entire park looks like it's been in a war zone or part of some sort of apocalyptic event. But that's not to say there's nothing recognizable here. Unlike places like Geauga Lake, which had most of its trace removed, Hard Rock Park is still pretty intact, most notably with its entranceway, with the sign still hanging and the theming still in place. The pathways still reveal the guitar shape in the concrete, and several smaller buildings allude to its former attractions. Perhaps the largest building still standing, however, is the former abandoned mall, a portion used as the dark ride track, and the rest a gutted shopping center. The vast parking lot also still remains in place, a grand entrance for this unbelievable abandoned landscape. One that doesn't have much of a conclusive future ahead. 2019 is really the last time anything moved forward with redevelopment. The owner put out a call to rezone the property for other uses, including retail and housing. However, with no public updates since, it's not really known what will happen to the land. The 2020 pandemic is not really helping anything with attracting new investors, and on top of that, in April of 2021, the landowner, former mayor John Rhodes, had died, potentially bringing all future plans in his possession with him. Today, the park still stands abandoned and in horrible shape. The property itself is squished in between two churches and medieval times, it being the only entertainment facility which has survived on the land, and one which has seen the entire transformation of its adjacent neighbor. When I first began this video, I had figured that Hard Rock Park was going to be some sort of faceless, vapid investment firm looking to create a cheap theme park. Honestly, what it actually turned out to be was so much more. It's honestly incredible that this all began with one man and a dream to develop a theme park and put his struggling theater to better use. The park he dreamed of could have only come from a man as charismatic and kind as he was, but more importantly, one that came from genuine care. The team behind the project were not only already very experienced in the industry, but they were so excited about what they were doing. There's actually a great presentation that John held at TEA, chronicling his journey and just what went into the park to make it so special. I'll leave a link to watch that in the description below. These creators cared, and what impresses me even more is that they took huge risks in almost every area of the park building whatever to make sure it fit their vision. Making cheeky and genuinely funny jokes everywhere they could, something you would never, ever see in a Disney or Universal park. I suppose that was the enormous benefits of working independently from a board of directors and shareholders demanding the company to proceed in a certain way. They only answered a hard rock based upon branding issues, and that was it. My god, they built a fish and chips restaurant and named it Codpiece Fish and Chips. They had a kid's play area themed to magic mushrooms. I mean, this stuff is hilarious, and it never took itself too seriously. Now, things like that did receive pushback from the typical people you would assume that would have an issue with stuff like that. And there were other mistakes, like I mentioned earlier, like the pricing, and the lack of rides, and the fact that they could be seen from the roads, and assumed that they were the same from other local parks like Six Flags. But it really all came down to the unbelievable poor timing of its opening. The recession was hitting every industry hard, but especially with tourism. It wasn't even really an issue with the park losing money. I mean, that's somewhat common with theme parks as it takes years to get back net profit. It was just the skyrocketing interest payments and no way for them to pay those off. At the end of the day, it wasn't the park design, it wasn't the branding or the logo or the rides or really anything else, but just really, really bad luck. It must have been so demoralizing for the people who worked on this, seeing their creation of years of hard work close just after four months. I have absolutely no doubt that Hard Rock Park left a lasting imprint on all of their lives, especially John's. 
And that's what just makes this story so unbelievably tragic. I know the timeline can get messy with all of the financials and stuff, but between Hard Rock Park and Freestyle Park's general operation, the theme park was open to the general public for a total of a little over seven months. A $400 million theme park between both companies was open for seven months. That is unbelievable to me, and such an enormous waste. The owners of Freestyle Park, however, essentially were the corporation I had originally thought they were going to be. An investment firm made up of Americans and Russians attempting to turn around a theme park with little care for the actual contents within, and instead resulting to a formula of attractions they thought they needed to add to gain attendance. With a terrible logo, honestly a terrible name, little effort, and no money, the park was poised to fail again. And it did. Honestly, in the end, I think out of all the videos I've done in the past, this might be one of the most tragic so far. What makes it even more sad is the amount of things that never got to happen. Hard Rock Park had multiple attractions planned as expansions, like a flume ride and a really awesome looking Mustang-themed vintage USA coaster. A Hard Rock Hotel was also in the works, as well as a seasonal Halloween event called Rock and Horror Nights. But of course, none of these were ever realized. Not only is this now abandoned theme park just a few years old, the facilities were basically brand new the day they were left abandoned. Just look at the brick down Main Street and how new it looked. I mean, this park was open for just a few months. The pathways, the props, everything purposely and thoughtfully put there only to be experienced by a very limited number of people and just not too long later, left abandoned and rotting away. And now it stands today as a spectacular failure. Perhaps ever in theme park history, and one of the last privately built theme parks in America. It's certainly a sad and unfitting end for the world's first rock and roll theme park. So, I'm a big believer in staying informed, especially when it comes to the business and finance world, and I think it makes sense why when you watch my videos like these and my bankrupt series. I'm always eager to stay up to date, but news these days have become very noisy and often difficult to digest. When I wake up in the morning, I usually just scroll through social media, but not really getting the substance in terms of the news that I would really like to have. So, I of course very much like what the crew at Morning Brew have created, with their easily digestible and fun-to-read daily newsletter that gets you up to speed on business, finance, and tech in just five minutes. Just this morning, I learned that Verizon is apparently selling AOL and Yahoo to a private equity company for around $5 billion, an almost $4 billion loss for what Verizon bought them for. So good luck to them, I guess. I've I've also been checking up on their COVID vaccine tracker for around the world, as I am extremely desperate to travel again. So if you're into staying informed, especially about tech and business, there is no reason for you not to sign up. All you need to do is enter your email address, and that's literally it. It's completely free, and honestly a fantastic sponsor which I've been using every morning. Click the link in the description below to subscribe to Morning Brew today. I appreciate all of your support, and remember, Close for Storm is coming out July 6th. Yes, it's finally happening. Anyway guys, my name is Jake, and thank you very much for watching.